Welcome everyone to our sixth learning lab. This is going to be on career paths. Specifically, we're going to be speaking about graduate programs and necessary exams and further professional licensing exams because a lot of young people have these visions about their future and their career but might not realize certain exams and certain obstacles that they may encounter on the way. So the purpose of this is to really just flesh that out and understand um, what exams you might have to take and also just what are the different options in graduate school and, and different career paths. Um, just to explain a little bit about myself, I'm born in Miami, Florida, just like my grandfather and my mother. And I graduated from the University of Miami with a JD MBA degree. And I passed the Florida bar exam and the series seven and series 66. So I have a history of exams and schooling, but I also understand what it takes to become a professional. And um, that's what I'm here today. Sonia Simran and myself, we are the chair people of IVIS Prep, which is an academic educational support and tutoring company. So we really specialize in these exams, these higher education exams and um, professional licensing exams. This is by no means to advertise our services. It's just an open forum about what to expect, what you may encounter, and just really any questions you may have. And the great thing is I'm going to have Simran and Sanya ask me questions to facilitate and to you know introduce them a little bit. Um, Sanya is a graduate of FIU and she's really amazing. And Simran is a UM student and she's really amazing. And they have those different perspectives where um, Simran is currently in college, Sanya has graduated, and then I'm 31 years old and kind of looking back and, and thinking about some things I may have done differently or some things that I'm, I'm happy that I was able to accomplish. So uh, without further ado, we have a presentation, nothing to, um, we have a nice presentation. And um, let me just close these tabs. I don't want to be like the professor at UM. So um, let's get into, I don't know if you guys know who I'm talking about, but uh, oh, cool. You wrote a bio about me. This is me in my purple sweater. <laughs> and uh, I live in Coconut Grove and I have two dogs. If you hear them barking today, that was planned. Um, okay. So yeah, let's let's kind of talk. Let's open up the floor to Sonia and Simran to ask me the questions. And then if there's a corresponding slide, then I might go to it. Um, how would you guys like to begin? Um, I'll start. So basically, um, so my first question was, I actually have a bunch of friends who have like canceled brunch plans with me, like they're juniors, and they're studying for the LSAT. So I thought the LSAT was a post grad exam. Um, can you tell me some more about it, like preparation requirements, all that type of stuff? Yeah, what a good question. It happens to be about our first slide. So the LSAT is for students who are applying to law school and it's a law school admissions test. Um, I think students who are studying right now as juniors, um, it's actually a good idea because the test is difficult and the more time you, you study, the better you can do on the exam. So I wouldn't say that's necessary to be a junior studying for the LSAT, but I think um, it's something to consider. And what I've learned as a, a law school graduate and, and someone who's seen a lot of people go to law school is that the LSAT really is an important element of your law school application. And the best way I can explain it is this, is a good GPA and a good life story can help you get into a great school, certainly, a good personal statement. But the LSAT really is that barrier to entry because the law schools have uh, these rankings that you'll see in the, in the US news and, and different sources that rank the schools from first to last. That's very important. You know, everyone really talks about a T14 school. There's some distinction about that. And the rankings are primarily based on incoming LSAT score. And the reason for that is because it's, it's a pretty objective measure of the strength of the class. 
it's it's hard to really differentiate how strong a class is in any other objective measure than a standardized test. So I say that the LSAT is kind of like a barrier to entry in the sense that if you want to get into a school, you should consider what their minimum LSAT requirement is and understand you will need to get that minimum LSAT requirement before your application really is considered. So the LSAT really is an important exam. It's a, it's a difficult exam. And uh, Sonia has actually been studying for the LSAT so she can attest to it. What, what are your thoughts about the exam, Sonia, and, and things you found difficult or easy or? Yeah, means? so because of COVID, they had to readjust the whole format of the exam. So it is shorter, but it still has some relatively difficult questions. It's two hours and 30 minutes. I would suggest, like you said, you really want to have a good understanding of like what law school you want to go to and kind of get that target LSAT score and kind of work for it. You do need to put your hours and you need to study. A lot of the material may not be, you may not understand it right away, but if you have like a tutor or a friend that's gone to um, law school or has a good understanding about the LSAT, they can definitely help. Um, I will say in my personal experience, having someone there to explain certain questions really did help because you do need to understand the LSAT language a bit. But other than that, if you put your time and effort and try to understand the material, I do think it's a doable test and you can easily, not easily get the score you want, but if you work for it, it is possible to get it. I think you really said it perfectly that the LSAT, as opposed to other exams such as the GMAT or the GRE is an aptitude test. It's not like you can memorize formulas or anything. You really just have to practice the test over and over again, and then you'll get better. And that, that's really what I recommend. So if I were a young person right now, a, a junior or a senior, and I was thinking about law school, I would recommend taking full length practice tests and just seeing where you're at and then reviewing it, taking another one. Or if you can't take a full length practice test, just do a couple sections, just try to familiarize yourself with the material because for instance, when I took the LSAT in 2011 and now I've been tutoring for it for many years, I'm way better now than I was. You can, yeah. you can consist, you can constantly get better because it's just, it's, it's like, it's not impossible. The game section of the LSAT is so daunting to people at first, but then it always becomes their favorite section because it's like doing a Sudoku puzzle or something. You just do it over and over. Yeah. You really get a hang of it. Um, looking at this slide, I, I see uh, some schools accept the GRE. Um, that is true. Some schools do accept the GRE. I, I think that law schools prefer the LSAT in their ideal candidate. But if the LSAT really gives you trouble and you're a good mathematician and, and you score well on, on GRE type uh, reading, then that is an avenue. I, I won't say that the GRE is bad and the LSAT is good. I would say if you want to be the ideal candidate, get a knockout score on the LSAT and get a great GPA and, and do your community service. And don't underestimate that. If there's one thing that, that you should be doing, it's community service because people don't do it. And if you have robust community service on your transcripts, you'll stand out because a lot of young people today can be viewed as kind of selfish. And you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, we're very absorbed in ourselves. So if you can show that you care about the community, then I'd recommend you know, doing some community service. But back to the, to the LSAT, they, they do accept the GRE, um, but the LSAT is ideal for an ideal candidate. And um, I, I put this last point, taking time off between undergraduate school and law school may be beneficial. That's an interesting perspective because I didn't do that. I went right into law school. And then when I was in law school, I did the MBA program. I just, I went right through my, um, my schooling. But I noticed that people who took a year or a couple years off in between undergraduate school and law school took law school more seriously. They did better and they transitioned into the practice of law more fluently. Um, people underestimate what it, is, what it is to be an attorney. An attorney is someone who represents someone else someone else, someone else's affairs, 
and someone else's um, business, someone else's estate, whatever it may be, it's a very serious profession. And I think a lot of young people graduate, they don't know what to do, they go right to law school, they're 25 years old and they're supposed to be a lawyer. And you know they're still going to Coachella. I'm not saying that lawyers can't go to Coachella, I'm just saying that, you know, it's a very professional thing to be an attorney and you want to be prepared for it. If you're ready for it and you can't wait to practice law, then, you know, go right through. But if you kind of want to experience other um, parts of life and get some working experience or whatever it may be, I wouldn't shy away from that idea because I think a little maturity is good before entering law school. And I can just say that personally, I think I was a little bit immature when I entered law school and looking back, maybe I would have, uh, done better had I taken some time off. But everyone is individual, and um, you know whatever's best for you is, is best for you. And, and and we're here to help. Does anyone in the audience have any questions about the LSAT or, or law school? Is anyone thinking about pl applying to law school? Um, I actually have a question. You were saying that the um, that it's beneficial to like take practice tests. Do you have any like places where you can find those? We have every practice test that has ever been issued. Um, I'm not sure if someone specific invited you, but if you provide us your email, if one of you, um, Sanya Simran has your email, I'll send you an email to, with all of our exams. Um, that's no problem. The great thing about the LSAT is the materials are out there. You could sign up for Khan Academy, which is a free resource sponsored by the LSAC, the Law School Admissions Committee, that is basically all the free practice exams. The material for the LSAT is previous LSATs that have been administered. And 90% of them are disclosed. Every once in a while, they'll have an undisclosed exam where we can't find out the actual test, but most of them have been disclosed. And I think we're at LSAT 92 right now or something. So there's no shortage of materials. And um, yeah, please, we'd love to send you some exams and you could uh, see how, how it goes. And that's, that's awesome. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions about law school or the LSAT? Cool. Um, all right, what's the next question we had on our menu? Okay, so, sorry, give me a second. Um, oh, wait, you know what? I, there's another slide on law school. Um, I, I think I might just say this right now, just some advice about law school. So if you're going to law school, everyone's focused on going to the best university. I would step away from that. I would focus on where do you want to practice? Because if you want to practice in Miami, then going to Harvard might not be as beneficial as going to FIU or Miami, because while you're here, you could build that network and that's the best way to get a job. Um, also, in five years, nobody ever asked attorneys where they went to law school. And that's something that young people don't really think about. Everyone thinks that it's such a big idea. Like you can't read where my diplomas are from, you know? No, nobody really cares. They just care if you can provide the proper legal service. And I see all the time in, in the courts and, and the legal system, the, some of the best attorneys went to law schools you've never heard of. So don't get caught up in this idea of, I need to go to the best law school. Get caught up in the idea of, I need to become an attorney because that's what I wanna do with my career. And the path to becoming attorney is going to an accredited law school and passing the bar exam. It doesn't have to be Harvard or um, Yale or something uh, of that nature. Um, oh, Simran, you're saying someone's trying to be let in. Cool. Oh, awesome. They can, you can add them to the wheel too, don't worry. So um, that's, a, that's what I would say about, about law school is don't necessarily get caught up in the prestige of the university, get caught up in what you want to practice, where you want to practice, your network. And I think that would be more valuable. Um, I say there's a lot of lawyers. It's an increasingly competitive field. That's very true. Um, that's true about a lot of things, but it's not a reason to uh, detract you or scare you away from becoming an attorney. It's just to recognize that just because you go to law school, you take the bar and you become a lawyer, doesn't mean you're going to get paid a million dollars tomorrow. It's still a very, it is a very difficult career. And you know, you want to make sure before you invest in going to law school and you invest in all that, 
that you do really see yourself practicing law and, and being happy doing that. Um, and yeah, it's necessary to pass bar exams in order to practice. Well, we might talk about that later. So what, what was your next question? <laughs> yeah, so basically the next question was, so I'm pursuing engineering. I've been hearing people talk about the GMAT and the GRE, but like what's the difference between them and how do I prepare? Okay, that's a good question. So the GMAT is specific to business school really, where the GRE is for most graduate programs. Um, I think I might talk about it maybe here. Yeah, graduate programs and careers. So most graduate programs require the GRE. The GMAT is specific to an MBA program, a master's of business administration. And for those in the audience and, and anyone who listens to this on recording, I went to law school and I did my MBA. So I know the most about those particular programs, but I do have general knowledge of other exams and other programs. I just can't really speak about it with the same intimacy. So just understand, I'm not advocating anyone here necessarily go to law school or go to business school. That's just my experience. But the graduate programs mostly require the GRE. Um, I've tutored for the GRE and the GMAT. So if you're, if you're thinking about going to business school, and we can kind of go back to uh, the business school slides. If you're thinking about going to business school, it's the same conversation I had about the LSAT versus the GRE. The GMAT is the traditional exam that is accepted by MBA and business programs. So the ideal candidate for the same reasons I talked about with class ranking has a great score on the GMAT. But the GRE is accepted at most business programs. And also the GRE is the exam for many other um, master's programs. Now, what is the content of the GMAT versus the GRE? It is similar in many regards. I will say the math is more difficult on the GMAT. The GMAT has this section right here called data sufficiency. And funny enough, Simran asking the question has tutored for the GMAT and understands data sufficiency. And that's something really incredible about Simran that she is an undergrad, but I pretty, pretty much um, tested her and, and realized that she had the capability to tutor for, for the GMAT, for GMAT math. So understand that the math is not impossible. In fact, the math on the GRE and the GMAT is not that much more difficult than the math that was on the SAT or the ACT. The problem is most students in college didn't take these math classes. So when they graduate from college and then they have to take a GRE or a GMAT, it can be very difficult to um, remember, you know, the FOIL method and algebra and um, some of these, uh, you know, distance and, and area of a circle, you know, things that are very simple, but you haven't refreshed on them. So they don't come to you as naturally. And that's what I would say. If you're thinking about the GRE or the GMAT, recognize that you will be tested on, on mathematics. So you definitely want to, study math. Um, the reading is, is comparable. The reading section on the on the GRE and the GMAT is comparable, you know, similar to the SAT, ACT. I actually think the GRE has um, the word associations, which I find tricky, but you know, sentence correction, these type of things are, uh, we're familiar if we if we took the SAT or the ACT, it's not that much different. I'd pretty much say the GRE is the SAT or the ACT, just a little bit more supercharged you know, a little bit more logical based and uh, slightly different, more difficult um, reading topics and, and, and vocabulary, but not so much different. The difficulty is people don't give the diligence to studying for these tests that they deserve. And if, if you guys are going to listen to one thing I say right now, it's this, give these tests the diligence they deserve because these scores can not only be the difference maker and getting accepted into the university or not, it could also save you a lot of money in scholarship offers and things of, of that nature. So if you think about it that way, I've always thought of these exams as the golden ticket, right? All you do is put all your effort into studying for these exams. You knock it out of the park, you get into your dream school and, and you get a scholarship. And how do you do that? You study really, really hard for these exams. So that's, you know, something I really 
if, if looking back on, on my history, I did well on the LSAT and the GMAT, I could have done better. I'm just being honest. And I, I, if I could have gone back and, and my younger self, I would have studied harder, longer and, and put more into it because you, you can't go back. You're never gonna have another chance, another round at applying for these programs. So you really wanna do that diligence of, of doing really well on, on these uh, entrance exams, whether it's for graduate school or, or whatever program you're applying for because the implications could be major. It could be what school you get accepted to and it could be financial in, in scholarship opportunities. So is that pretty good about the differences between the GMAT and the, and the GRE, Simran? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. A anyone have any questions from the audience at all? Okay, great. Um, what's our next question from the script? Right, give me one second. Um, okay, so we did GMAT, GRE. So I took the LSAT and I'm already hearing about people stress about the bar exam. So what can you tell us about the Florida bar exam for law students? <laughs> I love how this says a lot of idiots have passed the bar. That's awesome because it is true. I'm not here to scare people. Becoming an attorney is not impossible. Becoming a doctor is not impossible. Becoming an engineer, an architect, these nurse, a PA, these great professions are not impossible. A lot of people have done it, but you should step back. And even the dumbest person who's done it, you have to give them a little bit of respect that they went through the process. And so I'm here today to pretty much explain what the process is and what you can expect so you can be more prepared for it. So the bar exam is the professional license exam for attorneys and very difficult exam. And it's just the fact that law schools don't really prepare students well enough for the bar exam. That's why my company, Ibis Prep, that's, that's how I started was tutoring for the bar exam. I realized how difficult the exam was and how much um, there was a void in which people needed extra preparation because they were going to law school, doing commercial bar prep courses, and then still failing at an astronomical rate, except for your school, Sonia, FIU does a really good job. But most of the other law schools in Florida were, were doing terrible. So you know, it opened up an opportunity for me. And um, yeah, it's a very difficult exam. I, I like the bar. It's, it's, it's interesting. You know, you, my uncle, who's an attorney, said this to me, you'll never know more about the law than when you're studying for the bar, because it really over prepares you, you have to memorize everything. So, you know, just something to, to keep consider to consider if you know anyone who's a, a 2L or a 3L, send them my way or, or talk to them and, and get them at least thinking that they should be thinking ahead because can you imagine, and I've seen this happen so often that it, it breaks my heart. People who go to undergrad, go to law school, and then they can never pass the bar exam and they don't practice law. It's, you know, it's not the worst thing. There's a million opportunities out there, but it does happen more than you would think. So you really want to understand the full picture. You want to become an attorney. So make sure that you recognize you're going to need to pass this difficult exam and maybe start preparing for it a little bit ahead of time. And I, I didn't, I don't think you guys asked any questions on the script about medical school, but, um, and that was, by the way, that was the, the, the tab that I quickly deleted. I was not looking at whatever the UM professor was looking at. I just was being honest. I don't know too much about the process of becoming a doctor, but I do know that it's very difficult and it's, um, it's rewarding. It, it is worth it. I think, a lot of people will say if they could go back and, and do anything, it would be to be a doctor, especially right now in the, in the pandemic. It's a very rewarding field and very secure. You know, you start your own practice, you have your own office, you're going to, you know, save lives, whatever it is, or you might look at toe fungus, whatever it is you do as a doctor, it's going to be a pretty rewarding career. <clears throat> but you have to think about it from an early you have to think about it early on because in undergrad, you have to take these specific courses. I know one of them was uh, what, what Sonia and Sim and I were talking about this morning, organic chemistry. So I think right off the bat, I would never have been able to go to medical school. But, you know, it's a, it's a really rewarding uh, career. The MCAT, notoriously difficult. These are the four sections on the MCAT. Um, I have an MCAT tutor on my staff. I don't know really what's on it, but I know that it's really, 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 really difficult. Um, and then this process of residency and passing medical boards, this is what I was learning about. It takes, uh, 
three to five years, depending on what specialty you do. Some specialties are five years, some are three years, but you do get a, a residency salary. And they said it was like, not that great of a salary, but you know, enough to, to do enough to, to live on and, and, you know, live. And then you become a doctor. So that's a, a journey and I admire it very much. I think if anyone in here is kind of on the fence about becoming a doctor, just recognize it's probably the most arduous journey, but the most rewarding. And I really highly encourage it. And if you're struggling with, like I said, the MCAT or the boards or anything, you know, we're here to help. And, and, and um, there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, other exams that I don't think you guys ask about, but I, I touched on on my slide are um, the NCLEX for nurses. They need to take the PACs before nursing school and the NCLEX after underrated difficult exams the NCLEX is tougher than you think um PAs this pants exam uh also very very difficult and I know that's a running theme but I just think the purpose of this learning lab was for people to really understand what their career journey um requires because when they paint the picture for you in in high school they don't really tell you about all this, that you need to go through all these different things. And I think the earlier you think about it and the more prepared you are for it, the, the better it will be. And then, you know, there's a CPA was one example of um, another uh, test you have to take. CPA exam is super difficult. 50% passage rate on first time test takers. Um, so that's uh, the CPA exam. Um, other graduate programs and careers, um, professional engineers have to pass two very difficult company exam, competency exams. Architects take the ARE and do an apprenticeship. And then um, I talked about earning a doctorate degree. So people may have questions about that. Like how do you become a PhD or how do you become a, um, a doctor of education? Really the path is first you get your master's and to get your master's, you usually take the GRE. So you take the GRE, you get your master's and then you apply to these doctorate programs and you know it usually involves a thesis or dissertation or some process that I don't think is too fun but is necessary. So that's the kind of path for becoming a doc or a, a PhD. Um, can you just give me one second, Simra and Sonia? Sorry. Sorry about that. If you want to be a veterinarian, then you, it's also a difficult exam, but my dog loves to cry in the middle of uh, our learning labs. So anyway, um, what was the next question that we had? On our Andrew, table? we actually have a question from a guest. Um, Gabby wanted to know, how do you think tests like the LSAT can change to better evaluate students? That's really interesting. So are you saying that the LSAT currently is not a good way of evaluating students? Is that Gabby, do you, do you want to explain? Is she here? You can type if you want. You don't have to speak. I, I understand what the, what the question is, that a lot of people don't really believe that these standardized tests are good measurements of competency and ability to to practice the profession and you'll see that that they're making um changes i think the game section of the lsat is on its way out i don't know if it's been 100 percent confirmed but they're talking about removing the game section um a lot of uh, schools are accepting the GRE in lieu of the LSAT. And it's tough because I, I understand if you're not a good test taker and you have, you know, test taking anxieties, it's not really a fair way of measuring your abilities. Um, and, you know, a really great GPA and a, a sterling, um, um, a sterling uh, resume is a way to improve your chances, 
But right now, these scores, these tests really do matter. One thing that I know is common is students get um, accommodations, right? If you have a history of learning um, needs or if you've ever been prescribed to uh, medication, learning medication, then some students get uh, accommodations. And you know the process; it's not not impossible. So if, if you're a, a, a test taker and you really find that the test is going by so fast and you can't focus, email me and I could put you in touch with a professional who has helped students get accommodations on some of these exams. That's something to consider too. If you think that you might need accommodations in the future, take the steps now to ensure that you'll be able to get those accommodations. You know, go see a uh, um, maybe a therapist or a psychi psychologist, psychiatrist, I'm not, I'm not sure, but the right person who could, who could help. Are we getting um, chats maybe? Yeah. Awesome. Um, um, yeah. So uh, let me just make sure I'm finished with Gabrielle. Is that sufficient, Gabby? Is she saying, how can the LSAT change to better evaluate students? I personally like the LSAT. I think it's a fun test. But I mean, if I was overseeing the entire process, I would do away with it entirely. And I would focus much more on one on one interviews. And I could do, you know, a little, I put you on the spot, you know, I'll, I'll, here's a, here's a, a trial. What, what, what's your thought? And then grade people on that. I think that's how it should be. But I not yet have much of a say in the in the landscape of education in, in the United States. That's what we're working on here is really revolutionizing it because I don't love the the institution of education in America. I think it costs too much and you learn too little. That's kind of why I started my business is to really help people learn for value. So, you know, we charge by the hour and we teach, you know, things that are really important to learn. That's why I, I say, how do you go to law school and then you graduate and not know how to pass the bar? What are you learning in law school for $100,000? That's my question, but um, so I wanted to let you know that I agree with you, Gabby, and and yeah, I, I think that I, I answered that, that it could change in personally to be more individually tailored, but because of the capitalistic, institutional, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it is what it is, and you should just prepare for the test as it is. Um, what is the next question? You should only take the GMAT once because if you take it a second time and you get a lower score, you can't go back. You can't go back and choose to report your first score, to to not report your first score. Uh, yes, that okay, that is true. But I promise you, especially in recent years, that is less and less of a factor. Where it used to be, it used to be important your average of scores. Now it's important about your best score. So, you know, you don't want to take the GMAT six times, but if you take it once to figure it out and then take it twice and three times, that's okay. They will probably see, I mean, they will see for the GMAT, the business schools will see all of your scores and you're right that you can't um, go back and not report it. But when you understand the economics of it and that they just need that score for their ranking purposes, then it's not that big of an issue. And really do try to understand this. It's a business, there's a business of education. And as a student, you're a client slash commodity. They want you, they want students because students pay tuition and students you know, buy books and students um, do other things on campus. So they want you, but they want you to have the credentials they need to maintain their integrity. So um, with that being said, to maintain their integrity just means average GMAT score of the incoming score. And when they, when it comes to the averaging that incoming score, it's the highest scores. So my, my short answer to that is don't read too much into that about only taking it once, not something you should have anxiety about. You should, uh, you know, take it once. And if you don't do as well as you think, take it again, you're welcome. And that's a general advice to everyone in every exam. 
don't only take it once. If you only take it once, you're selling yourself short 100% of the time. I can't finger, think of a single time where I did something on my first time and said, oh, that's the best I could have ever done. Like, no way. You go into the test, you, your, your, your butterflies are in your stomach, you, you start sweating, you know, the dog barks, you know, like, and then you're like, oh, well, next time I would have done X, Y, and Z different. No, not next time I would have done. Next time I will do X, Y, and D different and get that better score because like I said, the value of improving your score is so important. So don't sell yourself short. Don't just take it one time. Unless it's a pass-fail test and you pass. That's the only time you should take it one time. I don't care if you get a 170 the first time you take an LSAT. Get a, take it again because you've got 170. You could get a 178. You know, like that first test, in my opinion, should always be the trial run. Like don't go into it cold. Don't go in without studying. That's a waste of time. Study for it like you're only going to take it once. You know, like hope, pray you get the perfect, perfect score. But 99.99% of the time, you're going to walk out of there with a little bit of a feeling that you could have done better. And that's the worst feeling. I still have that feeling about my LSAT and my GMAT to this day. And, you know, I could have done better. I could have been put myself in a better position right now just based on couple extra months of studying and you really have to understand that at, at the age that most of you are a couple months a few months is absolutely nothing a few years is absolutely nothing to me i finally realized you know from an investment standpoint and just from a growth standpoint and from an, um, a maturity standpoint life moves in like 10 year cycles you know think of life in 10 year cycles and in a 10 year cycle a month or two not that big of a deal right where you want to be in 10 years. That's what you should always be asking yourself. And what do you, and then work backwards. Imagine yourself in 10 years sitting where you want to sit or standing, I don't know if people like stand up desks or people don't want to work. Maybe you want to be retired by then, who knows? Whatever it is, imagine yourself in 10 years and then work all the way backward to this moment. And what do you need to do? You know, what steps did it take to get there? And, and that's usually starts with studying for one of these exams and uh, doing better. So long winded answer to that question, but I would not give too much credit to only taking it one time. And in general, I would always try to take a standardized test more than once because it's only natural that you're going to do better your second and even potentially third time. By the time you do it four times, it's like, I feel like you probably peak at three. That's my general uh, observation, but that's not a, a black and white thing. You know, some people do it the best on their second, some on their fourth i'm not really sure but um statistically i would say that three is pretty much the peak for an exam and i know that sucks to hear like who wants to take the lsat three times you know nobody but if your third time gets you a scholarship to your dream university and your first one got you no scholarship into trash can university then it would be worth it so and no university is a trash can i don't mean that any law degree is a law degree i'm just saying in the grand scheme of things a little bit of harder extra work and another test or two, not going to be a big deal. And I tutor for the LSAT and the Florida bar. And I always ask my people studying for the bar, which one is harder? Which one did you hate more? And they always say the Florida bar. And I'm like, that's just because you have a short memory because the LSAT was absolutely miserable too. So miserable. In fact, um, I've done it long enough that I've tutored people for both. And I'm like, I remember you during the LSAT. You were miserable. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess. And it's like people think that what they're going through now is so miserable, but then looking back, it really wasn't that bad. So just kind of tell yourself that if any of you are stuck in this rut right now of like you're taking exams and you can't, you know, you don't want to take it again. You think that's the worst thing in the world, not the worst thing in the world. And in fact, it's the most common thing. And if you only took it once, that would be, in my opinion, the worst thing in the world because you didn't give yourself the opportunity to really do your best. Um, was there another question we had? I think we did have one more question, right? About the securities exams. I know you're supposed to be asking the questions. Yeah. All right. The securities exams. What's the question? I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Um, the question for the securities exam was, yeah. So for people that want to potentially intern or work for a financial firm at some point, um, how can these securities exams boost their application and can they help someone that has a hobby of trading also? 
That's a wonderful question, Simra. I'm so glad you asked it. <laughs> well, right now is a very interesting time in the world. The reason is because everyone and their mother is an, a genius stock trader or, you know, everyone knows how to short stocks and, and short squeezes and um, diamond hands to the moon. So I don't know if you guys know what that means, but it's like right now there's young people, old people, people on Reddit, everyone's trading stocks. And that's cool because stocks are really cool. But being educated about stocks is even cooler, you know? And I just want to let you all know what is the professional route to being a licensed stockbroker or an investment advisor. And I am a licensed stockbroker and investment advisor. That's because I passed the series seven and the series 66. So those, you know, if you ever watch the Wolf of Wall Street, there's a scene I'll, I'll speak on the new Wolf of Wall Street, the one with uh, Leo, where he gets out of the elevator and he's like, I just passed my series seven and I was officially a stockbroker. And then the next scene is like him and um, Matt McConaughey and they're like at dinner table. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie, but the point being is the series seven is like the big one to become a stockbroker. You know, if you want to become a stockbroker, you have to pass the series seven. Now, here's a very interesting piece of information for young people. And I know I said, if you remember anything, remember that, but if you're interested in, in stock trading and financial planning. Remember what I'm about to say right now. And if any of your friends are interested in stock trading and financial planning, remember what I'm about to say right now. So you used to historically needed to pass the series seven, but in October, can you still hear me, Sonia? You can hear me? Can you, can you say, it, say it again? Because you kind of froze for a minute. Yeah, I got it. My internet's unstable. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, the Series 7 is the exam to become a, a stockbroker. And it's a really, really hard exam. Historically, it was like a four-hour, 250-question exam, like super hard. And then in October 2018, they segregated it into the SIE and the Series 7 top-off and the Series 66 top-off. Whereas now there's this exam called the SIE, the Securities Industries Essentials. And if you know the, if anyone came here to, to learn about this, this is your moment. The Securities Industries Essentials is the exam that is the prerequisite to taking the Series 7, the Series 66, any of those securities exams. The difficulty in the past when there was no SIE was that in order to take the series seven, you needed sponsorship with a broker dealer. So you needed to already be working for Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan or, um, you know, whatever, whatever company in order to take the series seven. But that was kind of like a catch 22. How are you supposed to get hired by JP Morgan if you didn't have any experience in trading or right? So it was kind of a, a tough scenario. So what they did, and the other reason they did this is to, um, there's a series seven, series 66, series 24, there's all these different series exams. And they figured that there was foundational material that was similar to all of them. So they wanted to create a foundational exam that tested all that material. And then the unique material will be tested in the top off exams. So the one reason they did that is to, to make it a, a foundational test. The other reason is to give people the opportunity pass this exam without sponsorship, meaning you don't need to be sponsored by any broker dealer to pass the SIE. And why is that valuable? Because let's say there's a kid who graduated from Harvard University and he was, you know, really smart. And then there was a kid who graduated from Miami-Dade and was, you know, really smart. But the kid from Miami-Dade already passed the SIE. A broker dealer is more likely to hire that kid from Miami Dade who already passed the SIE because that kid is halfway to getting his securities license. And getting your securities license is the huge drop off point in financial planning. Do you know how many times they hire these young people to become the next, you know, uh, financial planner and they can't pass the securities exams because they're so hard? Again, that's why one of the reasons we started our business was to service this, this void. But that happens all the time. 
it's a major risk for them to hire a young person and have to sponsor them and, you know, give them. So most of the time the, the company hires you and the first three months, you don't, you don't see a client. You just study for these exams because if you don't pass these exams, you can't become a, a, a licensed advisor. So you're useless. So literally they pay you to take these exams. How crazy is that? But now what if you already had one of the two exams, they only have to spend half of the time dedicating to you passing the exam. And they already know that you have what it takes to pass the first part of the exam. You already know about the industry. You got your feet wet. It's really like, if I could go into every single business class in America right now and, and drop this jewel on these kids, I would, because it's very new. It's 2000, October, 2018. It's not something that's been an opportunity. So every young person I know who's passed the SIE and taken my advice, which is two, you know, it's not like a lot of people listen to me, but of everyone I know who did this, they got, they got swooped up right away by Raymond James and by um, Goldman Sachs right away. They were, they went to university of Miami. Um, I'm telling you it's, it's a, a golden ticket. So what's on the SIE, you know, it's, it's about stocks, bonds, capital markets, financial markets, um, if you guys want to learn one thing about the economy today, I think this is a cool fact that like, I wish more people knew, but the difference between bullish and bearish, right? That's why you see a bull outside of, um, outside of the, um, wall street and every financial advisor, stockbroker is always rubbing bulls and they love bulls because if you're bullish, it means you think that the stocks are going up. You're optimistic. If you're bearish, you think the stocks are going down. You're pessimistic. And the reason for that is because bulls, when they attack, they attack like that with their horns up and bears when they attack they attack with their claws down so if you ever hear someone say i'm bullish that means they think that the economy or the stock or whatever they're talking about is going up and if they're bearish they think it's going down so i mean that's just like a tiny little like chapter one verse one note um that's just like a, an intro but that's the type of material that's on the sie and i think even if you're not going into financial planning it's cool information to know because you know, you don't want to buy GameStop at 400 and then the next day it's 20 and you have no idea why you just financial education is, is, is valuable. So I think that's what I was talking about. You know, my, the securities exams, taking the SIE as a, a great way to uh, position yourself for one of these broker dealers or investment advisors. So I think that's all the slides and all the questions. Um, anyone have any, anything at all? A little question at all they want to ask about anything before we do our hundred dollars worth of raffling for all the participation um okay well i know everyone's been really <laughs> anxious to go ahead oh nothing i was excited to spin the wheel <laughs> okay um well before spinning the wheel there's also one moment that we've all been waiting for all right so did you tell anyone what the quote is, Sonia? Does anyone know? No. Okay. No. Okay. All right. Here's another, uh, another $10 giveaway. If anyone can guess who the quote is by in the next uh, 20 seconds, it's by a female artist. Another $20 giveaway. Do we have any guesses? Can I guess? Do you know who it is? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No guesses? Sabine wants to know. No, you have to guess who it is and then we'll say what the quote is. Yeah. Right now you have to guess. Sabine, give it's your chance. Um all right. <laughs> We're close. You're close, you're close. What else? Is uh, it Taylor Swift? Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, cool. I say 20 bucks. Don't ever doubt yourself or waste a second of your life. It's too short and you're too special. Does anyone know who it is? Still no one? The one and only Ariana Grande. So awesome. Thank you all so much for, for being here um, and for joining us. Uh, now I'm gonna make Simran the host. Excited, okay. Um, yeah. 
Okay, can I share my screen? Yeah, and just um, before that, Simran, I just mm -hmm. want to kind of end the session for the recording. You know, thank you all very much for coming. We hope you found this valuable. If you would have came to the live session, you would have been part of this uh, $75 and $25 raffle we're about to do, but don't worry. We do learning labs all the time and um, we're the leaders in education and we're excited to have you uh, join us. So. Also, you can find this video on YouTube too. So you can send it to your friends. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, you have to make me the host back again, Simran. Sorry. Not the recording, no. Uh, I, can, I can stop it. Okay, stop it, yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>